Thank you all so much for coming uh, so early on a cold morning. Uh, I'm Thanasi Kambanis. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here at the Century Foundation. We're a progressive nonpartisan uh, think tank that seeks to foster opportunity, reduce inequality, and promote security at home and abroad. Uh, this year we're celebrating our 100th anniversary, uh, so we're going to have a lot of public events and, uh, and other uh, hullabaloo around that, and uh, which we're very excited about, so please stay tuned. Uh, and meanwhile, today, uh, we're here to talk about the fantastic research of our fellow Dina Svandiari and her research partner, Ariane Tabatabai. Uh, they have written this recent pot boiler, Triple Axis, Iran's relations with Russia and China. Uh, and uh, uh, sadly, uh, it, it's always topical. Iran is always topical for, for unfortunate reasons, which have to do with uh, America's seeming obsession with, uh, with having, a, having a villain and, uh, and drafting Iran into that role. Uh, and of course, uh, from, from the vantage point of the Middle East, uh, Iran's own very problematic behavior as a, as a regional hegemon and sponsor of militancy. Uh, so we're going to get into a, a lot of, of, of the specifics and also of the, the geopolitics of um, the Iran deal and uh, Iran's efforts to insulate itself from American uh, uh, pressure. Uh, uh, I think we'll start with a couple of, uh, w with, with a few remarks from Ina and Ariane, and then I will ask them questions, and then I will turn it over to you uh, to, to ask questions. So without further ado. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having us, and thanks for being here. Um, hopefully the video is not worth it. I don't know if it's the talk will be. Um, but so I will get us started with uh, a bit of a uh, framework um, a discussion of the book, um, tell you a little bit about the questions we're asking ourselves when we started writing the book in 2014, the sort of questions we... Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that. We're recording, so we need the sound to go into the mics. We know you can hear us. <laughs> Um, the set of questions we ended with um, when uh, the book finally came out uh, a few months ago, um, a lot happened, of course, in between. Um, and, uh, and then I'll hand it over to, to Dina to, to talk through some of the specifics of, of the book that, that, we, that we covered. Uh, so just for, to, to get us started, um, you know, the, the both fortunate and unfortunate part of uh, working on this book for the past four years has been that um, all of a sudden the, the America's role in the world and the global order has become extremely topical. Um, and so have the, the roles and positions of three countries, Russia, China, and Iran. And we look at Iran's relations with those two powers, Russia and China, uh, in the book. Um, and the, 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 where the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, sits in all of this. Broadly, we argue that even though we tend to see Iran, Russia, and China as revolutionary powers, both in their domestic dynamics but also um, internationally, uh, we tend to look at the three countries as trying to upend the international order that was created post-World uh, War II uh, and in the, the West and America's uh, image. Uh, we, we argue against that and, and essentially say that the three countries tend to see their national order as providing both opportunities but also challenges to their own interests. And so they tend to work within the framework of their national order when it suits their interests, uh, but they also tend to undermine it when it doesn't uh, and when their interests tend to uh, take them into, into different directions. Uh, ultimately, though, even though Iran, Russia, and China have all tried to create or support alternative parallel institutions uh, to the, the global order, uh, they've also worked within, those, uh, within the, the framework of those institutions and the laws. Uh, and we're happy to come back to this um, in a bit. The second point uh, we make in the book is that, again, despite often seeing the three countries as revolutionary, as ideologically driven, all three are actually very pragmatic in their approach to foreign policy. And it is <coughs> precisely this pragmatic nature um, that has led the three of them to work together. Um, after all, Iran, Russia, and China don't see eye to eye ideologically. They don't have 
a partnership that is based on, uh, on values. They have a partnership that is based on interests. And so they're incredibly good at compartmentalizing uh, their disagreements um, and working together where they can um, and where their interests uh, dictate. And, and we'll come back to this in a second uh, when we break it down in the context of three specific areas, uh, po politics, uh, pol foreign policy, uh, economics and trade, and finally, uh, military and security matters. All of this doesn't mean that the three countries don't have deep distrust of each other. Um, we talk about Iran's distrust that is historically uh, rooted um, of Russia, uh, and Russia's distrust of Iran if, uh, as well. Uh, we uh, take a, we make a, uh, we have a couple of examples um, from the past few decades. Uh, the completion of Iran's nuclear power plant in Boucher, which took a long time uh, for, for Russia to complete. Uh, the delivery of the S-300 missile system uh, that, again, took a while for Russia to, to deliver to Iran are, are both recent examples. Um, but actually, the distrust goes back uh, centuries. Uh, the two countries have, at various times, shared a border. Um, some of the most devastating recent conflicts, recent, um, some of the most devastating conflicts in the past few centuries um, that Iran has, has had, uh, the most uh, chunks of territory it's lost have been to Russia. Uh, and, and so you have this, this distrust that goes back uh, centuries. Uh, with China, um, the, the distrust is not quite as rooted in history. Uh, it is much more about present day concrete issues that go back mainly to trade. Um, we take one example that the, in, in the book that, that we like to use, which is uh, that if you go around in the streets of Tehran or any, any Iranian city and try to buy anything, one of the first things that customers tend to ask um, the, the shop owner is whether or not the product was made in China. Um, and of course, the shop owner um, you know, quickly scrambles to say, no, 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 it's Turkish, Pakistani, or anything else you, you, you want, but it's not Chinese. And of course, 98% of the time, I don't, I don't have data for it, but a, a number of times it is going to be Chinese. But uh, it just shows you that people do not trust Chinese products. Uh, they don't believe that it has the same quality um, as, as, the, as products that you can, uh, you can get from, from the West or other, other um, areas. Um, so, but despite this distrust, this, this the cooperation has persisted, and we argue, in fact, it has strengthened uh, over the past um, uh, decade, especially. Um, and it is largely due to the two factors I mentioned at the beginning, one being that all three countries believe that the international order uh, must be preserved, um, and they can advance their interests um, in it um, at, at times, but also try to undermine it when it doesn't suit their interests. And the second being their ability to compartmentalize uh, issues. Um, and, and so Iran has really used these two factors to try to create um, its relationship uh, with Russia and China as a bulwark against Western pressure and isolation. And that is particularly timely um, these days as the United States withdrew from the nuclear deal um, in May um, this year. Uh, and um, as of last week, I think, many new cycles ago, it, um, it actually went, um, went back to reimposing sanctions on Iran. Uh, and where the, the roles of Russia and China have, again, become very prominent um, in, in shaping our uh, views of, um, of our policy toward um, Iran and the Middle East more, more generally. Uh, so to break all of this down a little bit and, and give you more concrete examples, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dina. She'll uh, talk about the three strands we cover in the book, um, Iran's economic, um, uh, pol political, and security relations with Russia and China. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for uh, hosting us for, for this launch. Um, so uh, as Ariane said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the three strands, um, but I'll do it very briefly so that if you guys have questions, we'll just take questions afterwards. It'll be, it'll be better to do it that way. Um, so the first strand that we look at in the book is the political strand, uh, the foreign policy um, uh, dealings between the three countries. And as Ariane mentioned, there have been uh, a lot of ups and downs in their relationships, but their relationship has been characterized by pragmatism and compartmentalization. Um, for Iran, it's been absolutely vital to have this type of big power support at a time where the international community has tried to isolate it uh, further and further. Um, but importantly, their political relations uh, has also been determined by what each individual country's relations was like with the US. 
So there have been periods historically where um, you know, China, for example, has wanted to cooperate more closely with the U.S., and so it's been subject to U.S. pressure to tone down uh, its ties with Iran, so, with Iran. And so there's been a lot of ups and downs in their relationship for that. Um, but again, as Ariane said, um, Iran and Iranians' perception of China and Russia is that they're both unreliable partners. Today, though, this is slowly changing. Um, the Iranians were very careful to continue to deal with um, Russia and China, even though they were negotiating with the, with the rest of the international community for the nuclear deal, um, just in case they weren't able to see the benefits of the deal, like the, the benefits that they were promised. And actually, it turns out that that was the right policy, because today, um, with the renewed sanctions, Iran is once again turning east to Russia and China. And it's in the minds of a lot of Iranian policymakers, it's really become official that at least in their unreliability, there is a, there's a certain measure of reliability that there isn't with the West, because at least you know that even if the products might not be of the same quality as Western products, for example, you know that they'll be there. And you know that relations with Russia and China, they aren't going to be tinged with, you know, you have to change your human rights record. You have to change your behavior. So it's a, it's a much easier relationship for the Iranians to entertain. So that's for the political strand. The economic strand has been largely focused on uh, energy. Beijing, for example, as everybody knows, needed to diversify um, its energy and, um, and, of course, is a big consumer. Uh, and so Iran became a, uh, a key country um, in, its, uh, in its efforts to diversify uh, in terms of its energy uh, imports. Um, and then they've also uh, been involved in, uh, in developing Iranian infrastructure. So the Chinese, for example, have been involved in the Iranian metro, Tehran metro system. Um, but that is also another example of, uh, of the Iranians believing the Chinese were dragging their feet. It took a long time. Um, things were slow. Uh, and so there was a lot of frustration in Tehran with, uh, with the pace of Chinese involvement in Iran. The Russians have also been involved in Iranian infrastructure. Um, interestingly uh, and importantly for the Iranians, the uh, Russians are actually OK with the transfer of production to Iran for, uh, for the goods that, that, that uh, the Iranians import. And so that's really important to Iranians who want to be as self-sufficient as possible. Keep in mind the context of sanctions and the idea of building this resistance economy. Uh, and so for Iran, being able to transfer some of the production into the country has been absolutely vital. Um, the thing to remember is that while Iran has been keen to turn west and to really open itself up to western businesses, uh, the Russians and the Chinese throughout this entire period have been present in the Iranian market. So while the Iranians may not like them, they have uh, unparalleled knowledge of how the Iranian economy works, who they have to talk to in order to get things done. Uh, they have real networks in Iran. So let's say even if sanctions weren't an issue and Western companies were going to flood the Iranian market, the Russians and the Chinese are light years ahead uh, because they'll know exactly how to get around the difficulties and the murkiness of the Iranian market. And then the third strand that we look at is, uh, is the military cooperation. So this is something that we don't talk about as much, um, largely because there's been an embargo on uh, dealing uh, with Iran in this realm. But, um, but the Russians and the Chinese b were present before the embargo. The Chinese were absolutely pivotal to the Iranians during the Iran-Iraq War um, and, and uh, were one of the few countries that actually helped it uh, get the weapons that it needed. Um, and importantly, this goes back to what I was saying under the political section, um, their cooperation with Iran is on a no-strings-attached basis. Um, so again, uh, even when there are you know, violations and sanctions, arms embargoes, the Russians and the Chinese will continue to deal with the Iranians. They'll, they'll draw it down a little bit, which is what they did um, under sanctions, uh, under US pressure, but it never really stops. And since the nuclear deal, um, they've uh, actually done a number of, of drills together. They've signed agreements to beef up military cooperation. Um, and they're kind of waiting until the uh, arms embargo is officially lifted uh, as a result of, I, I can't remember how many years of implementation of the JCPOA, but it, it, it's going to be lifted soon. Um, and uh, Well, quite a mark. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah. 
Um, and, uh, and so they've, they, they've signed these agreements, these deals, in preparation for uh, once this embargo is lifted. So those are the three strands that we looked at. And then something else that we, we cover at the end of the book, which we can talk about more in the Q&A, is what happens with the JCPOA. So once the nuclear deal was signed with Iran, um, this made it, even though the Russians and the Chinese were already dealing with Iran, signing the nuclear deal made it easier to deal with Iran. The idea was that it would alleviate um, some of the difficulties that people faced in, uh, in dealing with the Iranians. So things like making payments and transactions easier. Um, obviously, none of this is, or, or it's gone back to, to, to pre-JCPOA days now. But the idea was that it would facilitate dealing with Iran. And for a while, it did. Uh, and again, the Russians and the Chinese were you know, first to capitalize on, uh, on, these, on these things. And of course, when Trump pulled out of the deal, it's very interesting to note that Foreign Minister Zarif, his first trip was to Russia and China. So clearly, um, there's a real uh, belief today in Iran that, uh, that even though we would prefer to be dealing with the Europeans and the Americans, it's clearly not an option. So um, Russia and China is where we're going to go today. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask, and then, uh, and then I'll turn it over, over to you. Uh, the, so so the, the wider strategic argument you seem to be making is that um, isolating Iran helps strengthen China and Russia, right? And that, um, and that a sort of alternative, uh, you know, an alternative international system exists around uh, these countries that, you know, participate in our shared international system but are also willing to have their own parallel or, you know, black market uh, uh, international system. And, and I guess I want to ask you, um, what are the limits, what are the limits of that, the strategic depth afforded by, uh, you know, relations with these, you know, these are, in, in the case of Russia, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, the economic and military largesse that Russia brings to the table is not the same as, as what Europe and the United States would bring, which is why Iran was so eager to buy American airplanes or European airplanes and so on. Um, and it's slow. The, the Chinese products, you say, are inferior. But also, it seems like the Chinese commitment is, uh, is not necessarily ironclad, right? If they can, if they can get their energy needs met um, and they're under pressure from the United States not to buy Iranian energy, they might not. They might, they might not. There's no, there, because there's no common political project, they're not going to be committed to this ideologically, uh, you know, even at, at a high cost. So I want, I, want, I want to hear your thoughts on what the limits of this are. And I also want you to bring Europe into the story. Uh, the, uh, the special purpose vehicle, which you can explain, seems to be another alternative international system that's taking shape as a response to America's uh, abdication of uh, of its leadership on on the Iran issue. Um, so bring bring that in and 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 tell us how that how that fits into the picture. You can start with the question uh, with the with your first, first question. Then turn to you for. Please. You don't have to answer all the questions. You can just tell <laughs> tell another story. Um, so the limits of. Um, Iran's cooperation with Russia and China, I think three things. Um, the first one is um, that, you know, this is not an alliance that is formed between Iran and Russia and China. Um, this is not even the same level as Iran's relationship with the United States prior to 1979, which again comes with certain benefits for Iran. Uh, the fact that neither Russia nor China expects Iran to change its behavior. Um, but of course, the other way around is also true. Um, so the first limitation is that it's not a, it's not a strategic alliance like we have with Europe. Um, and, and so uh, it is always going to be much more limited. It is uh, a relationship that is much more ad hoc um, than it is comprehensive. Um, the second point is that it, this means that it's not, the, the relationship is not always very well integrated. Um, and I think one example of this um, is, is um, Iran's cooperation with Russia in Syria. Um, Iran has deployed ground forces, its own, and also militias from throughout the region um, in, in Syria. And of course, Russia for the past few years has provided air cover um, to uh, support the Assad regime. 
but there have been a number of tensions in that relationship. Um, at some point, Iran allowed Russia to use a base uh, for refueling purposes um, uh, in, its, uh, in its western province, uh, in its western region. Um, and, and that became, uh, it was publicized by the Russians, um, and it became a huge point of tension in Iran where um, critics of the government were pointing to the Constitution and saying that this was a violation of the Constitution, that the government was uh, essentially allowing a foreign power to come and use a military base, which is contrary to uh, 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 an article of the a provision of the Constitution. And so the, the fact that the Russians did not really think about the domestic political aspect in Iran or that they didn't care enough uh, to help the Iranians shield themselves from uh, criticism domestically uh, presented a challenge for the Iranian government, which had to then backtrack and, and come out and say that actually this was a one-off, it was not going to happen again. Uh, later on, they also backtracked that comment and, and said that they would provide the Russians uh, some access to the base um, on an ad hoc basis. Uh, but this means that the cooperation never really fully took off in a way that it would if um, you had a much more, uh, much more aligned countries uh, strategically. Finally, uh, because the relationship is based on interest, um, and, and, and as Dina was mentioning earlier, um, because the three countries actually look at their relationship with one another uh, through the prism of their ties with other powers, it means that they can never really fully trust each other. Um, to be there um, if there is better out there, right? Uh, essentially, when President Trump was elected um, and the Iranians, like I think others, were nervous that the new administration would develop closer ties with the Russians, um, well, they were a little nervous um, that the Russians would give up their partnership with Iran uh, to become closer with the Americans. Um, and this is something that they have to worry about um, with the Chinese as well, because the Chinese will never give up their, their ties with the United States, with other powers, uh, for the sake of Iran. Uh, and so you don't have that sort of reassurance um, uh, from, from uh, Russia and China if you're Iran uh, that your relationship is, is really truly grounded um, uh, and, and there to stay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I'll just add one thing to, to what you were saying about, particularly about the strategic alliance, is that interestingly, it was our impression that even though in, in the eyes of those of us who sit outside the region um, and who our understanding of international relations is that actually strategic alliances are something that we should have and that we strive to have, those three countries they're actually okay with the idea that their alliance isn't, it, well, their working relationship isn't an alliance. It's not a strategic partnership. Um, and, and they have no problem with it continuing that way because it allows them not to be subject to each other's whims and desires. And, you know, so it, it gives them a lot more flexibility. This relationship affords them a lot more flexibility. And you really can't um, underestimate how important that is to them. Uh, on the Europeans uh, and, and the SPV, so it's, you know, it's not, no surprise to anyone that the Europeans aren't really on board with what President Trump is doing at the moment. Uh, but it's, they're, a very difficult, they're in a very difficult place because um, they want to be able to stand up to the U.S., uh, particularly on this issue because, you, you know, the mistake from their perspective is very much um, uh, a, an American mistake. It's, Everybody else is implementing the deal. I think the IAEA came out yesterday and certified for the 13th time that Iran was implementing the nuclear agreement, um, even though we all thought that actually the, the country at risk uh, was, was going to be Iran, not, uh, not on the other side. Um, so for them, it's a bit of a tough situation because they're trying to put in place mechanisms to ensure that Iran reaps the benefits of the deal, the benefits that it was promised. The problem is um, the U.S financial reach uh, internationally is so significant that it's very difficult for the Europeans to, uh, to, to block uh, U.S. sanctions. Um, you know, the, using the dollar in, in transactions for almost anything, at some point uh, something will be dollar denominated, which means that, it, uh, that it's subject to U.S. sanctions. So they, there, has, there have been a number of mechanisms that were in place. There's this thing that they call the blocking mechanism. Uh, the idea for this is that basically um, the EU would use blocking mechanisms to protect their own companies 
um, uh, from U.S. sanctions and basically give them political cover uh, should they decide not to implement U.S. sanctions. But the problem is in practice, this is very difficult. How do you how do, you do that? Um, and the SPV system that was announced during the UN um, General Assembly last month, two months ago, uh, basically the idea is that they're designating a bank to, um, to process transactions uh, for, for deals with Iran. So uh, it wouldn't be in dollars, I think it would be in euros, it would be based in Europe, it would be completely isolated from, from the US, or at least that's the idea. Uh, I think yesterday, the day before yesterday, they mentioned that they, they were planning on doing this in Austria. Um, and so the idea would be that by using this bank, you're earmarking um, funding that you know, the Iranians will be able to use, and also it's protected from the US reach. The problem is the way that processing transactions works nowadays is that a, a payment will bounce through you know, multiple banks. And it's very, very difficult um, to ensure that at some point it doesn't bounce into a bank that has some kind of exposure to the US, which of course means, again, the US would have reach into it. And that architecture was created painstakingly after September 11th in order to be able to monitor and, and stop terrorist financing. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, you know, th this was actually a, 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 you know, an incredible undertaking in its own right that took, I'd say, 10 or 12 years to come to fruition, where, you know, in 2000, you had a whole, you know, vast acreage of the global financial system that wasn't under U.S. reach. And exactly. so we, we created this so that we could monitor financial flows. And now some of our closest allies in counterterrorism, the Europeans, are essentially being you know, invited or pushed or forced to, to undermine that very important process in order to, uh, to uphold another very important process, which is trying to find a way to normalize Iran. Exactly. So the, the problem becomes uh, not what's happening today. I mean, obviously, for Iran, the problem is, is very much in the now. But the, the wider problem, I think, for the U.S. is uh, a longer term problem because you're, you're finding yourself in a situation where countries like Russia, China, and now even the Europeans are looking for ways to isolate themselves from the reach of US sanctions, which means that they're going to put in place mechanisms that are, in this case, intended to help them do business with Iran. But hey, if it can be used for Iran, who says it can't be used for other countries that will be sanctioned in the future? Um, which means that in the long term, uh, the U.S. is sh shooting itself in the foot because it's, it's actually preventing itself from having as much reach um, uh, in the future. Uh, so this is a very real problem and something that I think is not being thought about enough here today. Well, the, what is the uh, possibility of reviving, um, well, how much of the deal is going to survive with America out um, and what, what remains uh, as a possibility for reviving, uh, you know, a deal that ac that actually works, and I mean, you know, if if the deal survives without America in it, and Iran does not resume its its nuclear process in a way, the deal will have worked even with uh, with 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 America pulling out. And I mean, is that is that a possible outcome? So I think this is where you're going to get some debate because we actually disagree <laughs> on, on this. Uh, I'll go first. Co-authors who disagree. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it happens. Um, but we didn't write about it in the book, so it's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I actually think, uh, and perhaps this is a, a little bit too optimistic on my part, but I actually think that there is a real interest for Iran to remain in the deal for now and for the deal to bumble along the way it has been uh, over the last few months. Um, Iran today economically has not... Uh, gained much. Uh, and, and in fact, any small minor gains that it had made um, right after the deal have been basically obliterated now with the, with the new sanctions that have come in. But politically, uh, it is in, it's a completely different ballgame. Uh, today's Iran appears the you know, reasonable, uh, multilateral, um, international country uh, an Iran that, you know, was absolutely not perceived this way five, six years ago. And still isn't, by the way, in the part of the world where I've been living. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I just moved back here from Beirut. And 
vantage point of up close, uh, Iran does not look like a beneficent, yeah. you know, reasonable player. But look at, for example, um, the, the UN General Assembly this year. Um, it was absolutely undeniable. The country that looked isolated was the US. Iran had everybody on its side. President Trump called a meeting at the UN Security Council uh, to, to basically call out Iran. And it actually ended up turning into a US bashing uh, session with every single country that were present at the UN Security Council meeting pledging their support to the deal and to Iran uh, and, and of course calling out the US for, for pulling out of the deal. So politically, Iran is in a very different league and a very different situation today than it was, you know, five, six years ago. Now, granted, um, it hasn't uh, received the benefits that it was promised. And this makes it very difficult internally uh, for those who are in power, for those who, you know, agreed to this agreement to, to continue to call for it to be maintained. And a lot of that will depend on just how stringent U.S. sanctions are and just how much the Europeans can actually offer at least a certain amount of, of reprieve from U.S. sanctions. If every, if all trade with Iran is blocked off and, and you know, Iran really is squeezed off the way that President Trump would like it to be, then admittedly the fate of the deal is, is a little bit less certain. But I think if it continues as is, and Iran and, and you know, the Europeans are able to use the SPV, for example, to facilitate a certain amount of trade with Iran, Iran is able to uh, uh, get its oil sold um, to countries like China, India, and Russia, then I think there's a chance that it can bumble along the way it is. And Ariane, you're... You just had your debate by yourself, so... I, I did, don't, I yeah. Don't want to <laughs> <laughs> this is how much we've debated. I was preempting her. <laughs> So I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about the, the future of the deal. Um, and um, I'll, I'll caveat a little bit and give it a bit more nuance. Um, the first question, I think, is whether or not President Trump is reelected in 2020. Um, I think that will have a significant impact on Iranian decision making. Because for the next two years, it is not very easy, but relatively easy for Iran to sustain the deal. Um, President Rouhani is going to be in power. Uh, parliamentary elections are not going to be uh, uh, for, for a while, for a few months. So um, the deal can be sustained. And so far, anyway, um, the Supreme Leader has indicated that he wants the deal to be preserved um, as long as the Europeans at least seem to be delivering uh, some of the benefits of the deal. If President Trump is reelected in 2020, um, well, that's another six years that the Iranians will have to sustain the deal and its limits without any benefits. Six? Um, four. Well, well it will two plus two four. Plus oh. four. Oh, but yes, <laughs> math. I don't, I don't math. Um, so <laughs> I don't math. So, I don't math. So by 2024, um, with a different president, the moderates likely um, undermined quite a bit um, as a result of the, the international dynamics of the JCPOA of US sanctions. It will be incredibly difficult for them to sustain the JCPOA. It will be very difficult to justify domestically why Iran is not resuming nuclear activities, um, uh, why it's preserving those limitations when um, it's not getting the benefits of the deal. So I think the first signpost to look for is going to be the 2020 presidential elections um, in the United States. The second thing is that um, I don't think that Iran would be dashing to the bomb in 2020 if on November, whatever it's going to be, President Trump is reelected. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case, but I do think that slowly but surely, Iran will begin to test the limits of the deal. And again, um, politically, it will have to do something. It can't just sit on its hands um, and wait for, for things to happen for another four years. Um, finally, I think that the Europeans, um, regardless, will be limited in their ability to deliver anyway, because yes, the SPV in the long term uh, will have significant implications for U.S. sanctions um, and the United States' ability to project power and, and to kind of get, you know, multilateral coalitions uh, to impose uh, sanctions. Um, but in the short to medium term for Iran, the SPV is going to be politically significant, economically much less so. Um, and so again, it goes back to the question of what are the benefits of the JCPOA and can Iranian moderates or at least anyone who is pro-JCPOA in Iran sustain, advocate for sustaining the deal when the country is clearly not seeing the benefits.
Um, I will yield my questions to you uh, in, uh, on the floor, and I, I guess we ask you to use this microphone. Um, and let's start with Lance. I have uh, two questions. The first one's simple. Do uh, Russia and China care if Iran gets nuclear weapons? The second, the second question is, is uh, deals with the issue of whether Trump is reelected or not. Even assuming that Trump isn't reelected, and it matters who the Democratic uh, nominee is, um, you have leadership within the Democratic Party. Schumer was against the Iran deal, and Elliot Engel is a senior member of the House um, Foreign Relations Committee, and he was against the deal. So what's your hopes, given that uh, political context? Um, go ahead. Should I start with the second? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, not all Democrats, of course, supported the, the JCPOA. Um, at the same time, Democrats, I think, right now have a couple of things going on for them that, that um, make me think that if President Trump is not reelected in, in 2020, we might have a different situation. And by, by the way, I want to clarify that I don't mean that I think the U.S. will walk right back into the JCPOA and things will go back to normal. I think that would be incredibly difficult regardless of who we have in office in, in two years. Um, I guess in three years, technically. Um, but, um, but so uh, the first thing is that Democrats right now want to, um, Democrats view President Trump's impact on America's leadership role in the world as pretty destructive, right? And I think that any Democrat who would come into office in 2020 will try very hard uh, to kind of mend relations with um, European allies, with their national community, and in that sense will walk back some of President Trump's actions. And I think the JCPOA would be a natural one because, after all, it is the major foreign policy legacy uh, of the Obama administration, and even those Democrats who opposed the JCPOA initially um, in 2014, 2015, during the talks and then when the, the deal um, was signed, were against walking away from it, uh, precisely because, not because they didn't believe that the JCPOA was flawed, but because they believed that walking back um, and withdrawing from the JCPOA would be a blow to American leadership and, and uh, partnership with, with the Europeans. Um, so that's the, the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, I think that um, the major question is not necessarily what happens in the United States, but how Iranian domestic politics respond to it. Um, in other words, even if the United States does not go back into the JCPOA in 2020, 2021, um, it will be a lot easier to sustain the JCPOA having someone in power in the United States who is willing to ease sanction, who's, uh, sanctions, who's willing to work with the Europeans, um, and uh, who has a more sort of positive uh, uh, outlook toward the JCPOA than it would be if you have President Trump in office who continues the maximum pressure campaign, uh, who continues to, to impose sanctions and to, um, to view the JCPOA as a deal that is bound to fail. Um, on the question of do the, Russian, the Russians and the Chinese care if Iran gets nukes, um, it's interesting actually one of the things that uh, I was often asked uh, during the nuclear negotiations was um, it, it doesn't make sense. Why would the Russians and the Chinese join in on negotiations to get a nuclear deal on Iran when they're benefiting from Iran's isolation right now? Um, it, I mean, I think the explanation for that is that, um, or at least at the time, today's Russia is perhaps a little bit different than Russia at the time, but at the time I think Russia was quite keen to kind of um, showcase its non-proliferation credentials um, it really did negotiate wholeheartedly uh, in, in the P as part of the P5 plus 1. There wasn't a lot of disagreement amongst the negotiators during the negotiations on, on the P5 plus 1 side. Um, so I just think that these countries were, didn't want, they, they didn't want the nuclear club to expand. They still don't want the nuclear club to expand. Um, there is a reason why there's only five permanent members of the Security Council, and they like that. They want to keep it that way. Um, also, Iran... Uh, is seen, or at least historically has been seen, as, as, as um, un, unreliable. Uh, and so a nuclear Iran, you don't really know what it would do. 
Um, so I think that I think they do care. I don't I don't think they want to see a nuclear Iran. Um, and then on top of that, uh, getting this issue dealt with and off the table, as I mentioned earlier, was going to make it easier to deal with Iran on a military level, on economic level, on a political level anyway. Just as a, a, a quick side note, I mean, in, in your writings, you, you <coughs> often talk about the, the perception uh, of reliability um, and, uh, you know, sort of the, so the U.S. looks unreliable for negotiating this deal and walking away from it. Um, but then, I mean, m you know, my impression from reading your work and also just life is that everyone's unreliable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is an, it's an international system where people pursue their interest and the, there's this, there's this fake presumption that like Russia and China benefit by being transactional in a way that we don't because we're moralistic. So, you know, Europe and America have these values-based policies, subjects us to charges of hypocrisy, and plus, because we are democracies, we end up having to change our policies, but these authoritarian behemoth countries, they have like satanically, you know, surgically effective foreign policy tools, and they just do stay the course and get what they want, and that's actually not true. I mean, their foreign policies wax and wane. They find themselves, you know, regularly and routinely unable to, to, to meet their promises, whether it's delivering S-300s or building a subway or building a nuclear plant or so on. So they're, they're actors just like the rest of us, you know, subject to the same constraints. Now, often they benefit by having spoiler aims, right? So if your aims are to keep the Middle East in chaos and, and keep Assad in power, yes, you have an easier road to hoe and you're more likely to achieve your goal, but that's not because you're better at getting what you want. It's because the thing you want is much easier mm -hmm. um, to achieve. The, the other thing that, that, that strikes me is, that, that I think is worth mentioning is um, I don't think you guys make this presumption, but there's a presumption uh, that I think is, is wrong, uh, that integrating a country into world markets will allow us to affect its behavior, right? So if you, this was the argument for trade with China in the 90s. If they, more, the more we trade with them, the more we'll be able to tell them to be like us on human rights and democracy. And it turns out that's not true. We can have a great deal of integration financially and economically, and our political systems remain distinct and we do what we want. With the Iran deal, uh, the, some, some parties erroneously argued that once this deal goes into effect, we're gonna somehow be able to turn Iran into a democracy or a, or, or, or a country that behaves more like the way we want them to in the region. So they'll stop supporting Hezbollah, they'll stop undermining you know, our, our aims in Iraq. And, and of course, there's, there's no evidence for that, right? I mean, if they're buying Boeings and, and honoring the deal that allows them to buy Boeing airplanes, they're not gonna also then turn around and forfeit the political and strategic influence they've gained by being a, a spoiler in the region for, for, for 30 plus years. Yeah, I agree with that. I would perhaps nuance it a little bit in that um, I don't think uh, certainly on our end, I don't think there was any belief that, you know, a JCPOA would equal a democratic Iran um, uh, or a democratic... No, I don't think, and, and I don't think the actual architects of the deal are... Yeah, yeah, but exactly, I, I, exactly. But, um, but I, where I do think uh, a, a working nuclear agreement with Iran and an Iran that is more open to Europe and the U.S. would have had an impact is that it would empower those in Iran who believe in multilateralism, who believe in dialogue, and who believe in engagement. Now, remains to be seen whether that would have actually had an impact on the ground in terms of, for example, what Iran is doing uh, or Iran's involvement in the region. I think personally that, for example, breaking up or any hope of breaking up Iran's ties with Hezbollah is just, you know, crazy. Um, but, but I do think it would have had, in the long run, a moderating impact on Iran um, because those in Iran who pursue engagement, those in Iran who, you know, pursue um, integration internationally would have been stronger in the face of their more hardline opponents. Um, so. can, I, can I add one thing, which is let's bring it down one level from the leadership to the people, right? Yeah. Um, as part of this, uh, the research for this book, we did a lot of field work. And one of the things that I think is striking to anyone <coughs> who goes to Iran is how dynamic Iranian civil society is. Mm. Um, the unfortunate thing, um, and I think it's, a, it's an unfortunate byproduct of both the regime's policies, but also sort of Western policy toward Iran, is that the civil society has largely suffocated 
um, by having to deal with the questions of you know bread and butter, right? Um, sanctions, economic um, uh, issues, uh, jobs, uh, how to feed your family. Um, when what it really wants to be doing and what it has tried to do uh, the best it could actually despite everything um, is to advance, the, to move the ball forward on questions uh, about you know, minority rights and, and women's mm -hmm. rights and, and all kinds of sort of civil rights issues and, and questions. And the, 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 I, I think the Europeans really have the right idea here, which is keep the JCPOA and then negotiate on other issues that are fundamental including Iran's regional behavior, but also including its domestic, uh, pol domestic policies. Um, and I think that the problem, part of the problem uh, of uh, the administration's Iran policy is that it is actually, instead of empowering the civil society, it's really suffocating it yeah. more. Hi, um, Albert Golson. Um, my focus is on the um, energy and oil markets. and. Um, Focusing on uh, China's role um, in, our, in Iran and the current situation that's going on now, prior to the agreement um, in 2015 on the Obama administration, um, China played a very critical mediating role in getting the United States and Iran together talking what have you in order to reach the deal. Of course, and that's not because China is a nice guy, simply because you know they, they, they needed um, energy from Iran, and they didn't want a repetition of what happened in Iraq uh, that basically imploded. So it's basically to keep Iran together, United States and Iran talking. Um, once you had the Trump administration reimpose sanctions, the interesting thing about it was at the very last minute, the Trump administration issued a waiver to China that Iran can sell oil to China. And of course, it's one of the, uh, China, I believe, is one of Iran's biggest markets. Now, do you believe that there is a linkage between the United States providing China a waiver at the last minute in order for China to, again, um, assume its mediating role to possibly come to a new deal, whether it's in this administration or going forward to the next administration, some sort of behind-the-scenes deal that China and Iran can work out something for a revised um, nuclear agreement. Let's take a, a batch because I'm, I'm, I don't want to – I see there were a lot of hands over here. Why don't you go – uh, and, and let's get the gentleman at the very end and this gentleman here, um, and, uh, and then we'll answer them in a batch. Thank you very much. Um, That's it. Well, um, yeah, um, I just had, I, I had two questions that mostly pertain to the strategic and foreign policy thinking in Iran and sort of its thinkers, and a bit of a step back from, uh, from JCPOA perhaps, uh, like sort of broader stuff. First question is that, you know, it's often, it's sort of a, belief, um, you know, sort of mentioned in uh, journalist articles usually that, oh, the foreign policy in Iran, it comes out of the Supreme Leader office, the government doesn't have a role in it. Uh, what one, you know, it, this doesn't seem to be true when, when we see that there are, in fact, different far, foreign policy thinkings inside the Iranian foreign ministry. As you know, the head of the foreign ministry is emblazoned with no Eastern, no Western uh, question, but there have, in, fa in fact, been differences, say, under Ahmadinejad to those you know, who were sort of looked to the east and the most more western stuff. So my question is, uh, in relation, in, do you see differences in how pr how the relations with Russia and China should be prioritized internally, and how you know how that could be different? And the second question is, is there any a strategic ambition or strategic thinking in Iranian foreign ministry that through their relations with Russia and China, they can in fact affect the world order or the way Russia and China? Uh, play their uh, part in the world or that. I.e., you know, is there a strategic thinking in Iran that perhaps through their, uh, you know, relations with Russia and China, they could push Russia and China into, say, a more anti-American um, or a sort of a different uh, order? It might be at the level of ambition, but um, I wonder if, if that's that. Uh, Great question. And the gentleman, not you, but the guy next to you. Oh. You. Sorry. Hi. Steve Goldberg. Uh, I've got a sort of a different question for you, and that is, where does religion fit in? You've got Russia, uh, the problems with Chechnya, just the tip of the iceberg with the relationship, either communist or post-communist, with the Islamic world. You've got China with its current re-education of the Muslim community within China. 
And of course, Iran is certainly identified as an Islamic nation. And how do those tensions interplay with the overall relationship among the three countries? Great. So let's take this batch of questions, and then I think we'll be able to take the next three or four uh, in a batch to okay. end. Whatever you want. Why don't we go in reverse order? Um, I think it'll be easier. So um, about your question about religion, um, the very short or nuanced answer is it doesn't. Religion doesn't play a role. Uh, the more nuanced answer is that, look, for all of its lip service, uh, paying lip service to religious oppressed people, Shia, Shia and Muslim oppressed people uh, <coughs> around the world, ultimately Iran, again, is a pragmatic player. And it understands that its relationship with Russia and China are not based on values. They're not based on ideology, religion, or seeing you know a, a common worldview. Uh, they're based on interests, and so it is very interesting that in both cases, both Russia and China have issues, to say the least, with their uh, respective Muslim populations. The Uyghur um, um, uh, re-education camps, quote unquote, you were referring to, of course, being the sort of very visible one, but also in Russia with with the Chechens. Iran is pretty silent about those mm -hmm. those questions most of the time. Um, it is very quick to talk about, you know, the Shia being oppressed in Saudi Arabia, for example. It's very quick to talk about the, uh, the Israelis' um, campaigns in, in Gaza, but it rarely talks about what happens in Russia and China uh, because it's simply not worth it for Iran, right? It need, at the end of the day, it needs those countries, and um, there is an understanding, I think, from all for all three that the domestic dynamics uh, within, um, within their own countries are sort of off limits, that the Russians and the Chinese don't tell the Iranians how to treat their own Kurdish minority, for example, and so the Iranians are not going to be telling the Russians and the Chinese how to treat their own Muslim communities. Um, all right, so your question about, uh, your two questions, I guess the first one um, was whether Iran wants to um, affect some sort of change uh, within Russia and China um, I, I don't think so. I think, again, this is because they're pragmatic, they understand that, A, their reach is fairly limited, that um, I think you know, one of the, the arguments we make in the book is that um, Iran actually understands the limits of its own power. Um, and uh, it understands that it has very limited capabilities. Um, and, and, and so it doesn't try to, um, uh, to, it has a very grandiose sort of rhetoric, but that the, in effect, the policy doesn't match uh, that rhetoric. Um, in terms of the foreign policy being created by the Supreme Leader, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the way I think about it is that the Supreme Leader provides a framework for mm. uh, how policy is made within Iran, but that how the sausage is actually made is a lot more complex and it entails many p centers of power coming together and building consensus uh, in order to get the policy out of the door. Um, how that translates in terms of Iran's relations with Russia and China, uh, the first thing is that, and, and we do this in the book, we look across different governments uh, for the past 20, 30 years, from Rafsanjani until today, um, and note that Iran's relationship with Russia and China on the one hand, and sort of the West, quote unquote, uh, uh, on the other, has varied significantly. Uh, from government to government. The way Khatami thought about uh, Iran's relations with the world is not the way Ahmadinejad thought about Iran's relations with the world, right? It was Iran became much more East looking um, under Ahmadinejad than it was under Khatami and it has been um, under, under Rouhani. Um, the, the, the other um, uh, aspect of it is that there is a domestic debate within Iran about how Iran should be thinking about its place in the world. Um, and you have various camps. You have people who believe that Iran should build much closer ties with Russia and China. Uh, you have people who are very much West looking, um, who have been pushing for closer relations with the EU. Uh, and of course, you even have people who, um, who argue that the Iran should really be working with the United States. Um, and so you have uh, uh, this sort of domestic um, debate uh, about how Iran uh, should be thinking about its relations with Russia and China. Yeah, and I think that ultimately uh, events outside of Iran actually determine who in Iran ends up getting a, a, you know, a step ahead in terms of their position in the debate. So inevitably today, uh, those who advocated closer relations with Russia and China um, are going to have a lot more sway 
um, than those who have been advocating for you know either uh, dialogue with the U.S. or engagement with Europe. Um, I think that the, as we've mentioned, the, the Iranian public um, is more geared towards uh, the West uh, than it is towards countries like Russia and China. Um, and, uh, and so I think that Iranian officials have to take that into consideration, uh, and, they, and they do to a certain extent, but ultimately uh, it doesn't matter how open they are to the West. If the West isn't open to dealing with Iran, then, then obviously uh, the Iranian government can't do much. And you'll get the obvious questions about China. Yep. That's where I was getting to right now. Um, so, uh, the would China be able to to basically help Iran get to a revised nuclear deal? Um, I think that, firstly, I don't think there is any desire um, on China's part uh, or on Iran's part, but that's that's a given. Um, uh, certainly on China's part to to get to a revised nuclear deal um, because they have a perfectly functioning deal today that uh, Iran and the remainder of the P4 plus one uh, is implementing. Um, now, and as we've mentioned, Iran is implementing it so far even though uh, it's not really got its end of the bargain. Um, so I don't think there's any desire to do that. I don't think there's any desire to rehash this issue. Um, I don't think that, I don't even, I don't, I don't even think that, that they would know how to um, how, how could we improve the nuclear deal? Uh, the only way to improve it or get a bigger and better deal, as President Trump says, is if you start bringing in a range of other issues, including Iran's regional role, its missile program. And these are things that Iran always said, if the nuclear deal is implemented and we have a quote-unquote good experience with its implementation, then nothing prevents us from discussing these issues further. And in fact, Iran's experience with the Europeans shows that they are totally prepared to sit down and talk about these other issues. The problem is today, their experience with the nuclear deal has been terrible. Um, so there is absolutely, if I was an Iranian official, um, and I'm pretty you know, pro-multilateralism and internationalism, I would turn around and say there's absolutely no way I would sit down and talk to, to, to anybody who wants to make me re-sign another nuclear deal. The first one, I didn't get anything out of it. Why should I do another one? And in fact, this is a debate that you have. Um, you had it a, a little bit around the UN General Assembly when uh, there was talk of President Trump um, wanting to sit down and talk with the Iranians uh, and, and whether the Iranians would, would take him up on, on this offer. Um, I think there was a little bit of debate within Iran about whether this was worth it. Um, I also think it was really quickly tabled because uh, on the part of those who are in power today, it would have come at huge political costs, even if they wanted to. And the political costs wouldn't have just been internal. It would have actually been international as well because it would have gone against what the Europeans are trying to do and the relationship that they now have with the Europeans. Um, so I think that we're not going to see any kind of dialogue or negotiation, no new nuclear deal anytime soon. Let's uh, uh, take the last three questions um, and end. Four. So, four? Okay. So let's, can you guys make them very tight? We'll start with you, then you, then you, then Mara. So, uh, um, but they believe that they can change Iran's behavior, um, and and they might be right. So, I, I, how much can you comment on on the on the on the ability to do that, and whether at at, at any point there may be a reckoning, no matter how right Iran might be, and and about whether or not it signs a deal, whether it becomes a choice, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, it becomes it, it, it ceases being a matter of choice and becomes a matter of survival. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, my good question about uh, an issue that I just, oh. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, so I wanted to ask about what I 
seen as being uh, perhaps at least currently one of the most divisive issues uh, currently being debated within Iran, um, which uh, among many, but um, the counterterrorism financing legislation that the Iranian parliament um, has been um, having ongoing discussions about for, for many months. Um, this is something that I've seen being one of the most, I guess, most divisive, most polarizing issues within Iran, particularly between the Rouhani administration and uh, allied parliamentarians that have been pushing for this, um, which as far as I understand, uh, based on comments from pro-Rouhani officials, that this is something that's been uh, demand, well, not demanded, but asked for by Russia and Chinese uh, financial ins institutions specifically in order to facilitate transactions. Um, also, as far as I understand, Iran is currently uh, been issued a temporary, I believe, a temporary exemption um, by the UN. Um, but you know, barring this impl uh, legislation not being implemented, they will be put back on the blacklist. Um, and I was wondering if you guys could comment on um, perhaps the the potential like political impact of this legislation one and two, um, how imp how truly important um, it is to be implemented to be uh, enacted into law for Iran to maintain uh, financial transactions with Russia and China. Okay. Well, let's let's keep the questions tight so we have. Uh, Time from our Do you want to take the others, or should we ask? I'd like to ask um, some questions that may not be in your lane. First of all, uh, what about the, if not the elephant, the rhinoceros in the room, Israel, and uh, perhaps the hippopotamus, Saudi Arabia? What, what role uh, do they? have in dis obviously a destructive role in 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 terms of the, the deal how effective can they be and the second question would be um, and again I don't know I don't know the initials correctly is that STV or SPV SPV special purpose, purpose vehicle. vehicle oh okay. special SPV uh, to what extent do you think that can serve uh, in, the, in the longer run or intermediate term as, as international means of exchange, thereby excluding the United States' participation in international finance. Not excluding, but severely limiting. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and Mara, to close. Mara, I'll close. Okay. Also, two questions. Um, Okay, mm, just about China role, uh, to what extent uh, China is really inside in terms of trade or infrastructure inside Iran? That's probably, uh, that's one. Second one is uh, would the um, assassinated General Soleimani bring, the, bring them to the table for another <laughs> one? Or is he disp uh, disposable can, or can, they, uh, can Iran survive outside of Iran? After being assassinated, that's my point. Is he, is he replaceable? I guess in the era that we're in today, <laughs> that's a way to frame the question. Okay, All right, I'll I'll start and I'll try to address some of them, and then and then you can pick up whatever you want. Um, on the, I'll go in the order that the questions were asked. Uh, can Iran survive? Um, I think. So I have to say, as a, as a European now sitting here, um, I cannot, I cannot um, just say how shocking I find it is that, that the administration here, there are people within it that truly believe that Iran is within a month or two of collapse um, and, and truly believe that what they're doing is only serving to speed this process up and that by Christmas, we're going to have a, a, a new system in place in, in Iran. I mean, I just, I, I, I can't have believe Iranian that. Do you Iranian uncles who believe that? Yeah. I feel it's, like everyone it's, does. It's true, but they're not in power. They don't, you know, they can't actually do anything. So, um, so I, I find that shocking. Um, needless to say, that's not going to happen. Remember, these are the same people who thought that democracy would bloom in Iraq after that's, our intervention. This, this, is, this is true. This is true. But it is. <laughs> um, this, the, yeah, needless to say, it's not going to happen. Uh, is the system in difficulty? I kind of want to say the system has been in difficulty since it came to power. Um, it's gone through ups and downs, whether that's been because it's been in a war or whether it's been economically or domestically. None of these things are different. Yes, now is a tough time. Yes, economically, they're going to struggle. And yes, there are a lot of people in Iran that are, to put it mildly, unhappy. 
um, because of you know, their economic situation, because of the price of food, um, and, and for a range of other issues. And we've seen since December of last year when the protests broke out that there have been pockets of discontent that have actually been occurring repeatedly. Um, and they've been, they've, they've focused on specific um, issues, so like teachers have come out, and, and I think it was, what is it, truckers have come out, and um, so there have been segments of the population that have come out and protested. On the one hand, this isn't anything new. Um, since President Rouhani has been in power, protests have been occurring, whether it was in the Tehran Bazaar or in, in other areas since, since he's been in power. Uh, on the other hand, it is a little bit tougher today um, for obvious reasons. But uh, I don't believe that imposing successive rounds of sanctions on Iran is going to make it collapse in, in a couple of months. It's just not going to happen. It might make things more difficult. It might squeeze Iran further. Um, but Iran isn't going to collapse because of that. Um, and on top of that, you end up having the opposite effect, which is a kind of rally around the flag effect of pushing the idea of building resistance and building a resistance economy. Um, and that starts to have, um, that starts to work in terms of rhetoric domestically in Iran. Uh, so I think that the government uh, is going to survive uh, for now. <laughs> um, I think that they will have to pay greater attention to the domestic discontent and really learn to manage it. Um, one thing that I point to in terms of a change in the way that they, they deal with this discontent is that when the protests broke out in December of last year, in the first couple of days after the protests, different government officials came out and, um, and said the usual, this is the work of foreign agents, et cetera, et cetera. After a few days, uh, the rhetoric changed. And, and including the Supreme Leader himself, he came out in, in, and, and legitimized protester demands. Um, and so, so far it hasn't really led to anything, but I think a, an understanding of what these protests are about and starting to really grapple with some of the things that they're asking for. Um, if the government can do that, uh, then I don't think there's any reason to believe that they're on their way out. Um, Israel and Saudi Arabia, can they be effective? Uh, I think they can be effective in so far as they have a, a captive audience. And right now in the US, they have a very captive audience. Um, and so they have been effective. Uh, it has worked. Uh, it's likely to work for as long as, as, as President Trump is, uh, is in power. Um, I think that uh, the problem, I, I can't speak as much to Israel, but perhaps a little bit more to Saudi Arabia. The problem with Saudi Arabia is how much it's going to overreach. Um, and we've seen that a little bit. Uh, there's always been a certain amount of goodwill towards the Saudis here. Um, I think that with what MBS is now doing, um, that he's really eroding away that goodwill. Uh, and speaking as somebody who comes from a country that the U.S. Congress absolutely despises, um, you don't want to be, uh, no, no, Iran this time. <laughs> Sorry, I like to play both cards. <laughs> um, I that too. <laughs> no, as a, as a Saudi, I don't want to get, I wouldn't want to get to the point where U.S. Congress decides to make me a target. And, and I think that's very much the direction that they're heading in. So if they don't kind of rein things in um, and be a little bit more careful, uh, their effectiveness is going to, uh, is going to severely diminish. Um, in terms of the, I'll, I'll finish with that and then you can do the rest. <laughs> in terms of the uh, long-term uh, impacts of the SPV, so the, yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier. Um, you're absolutely right. Today, these systems are being put in place to tackle the Iranian case. Um, absolutely nothing prevents the international system from reusing it to tackle other cases in the future in order to ensure that uh, countries in the world are not as subject to U.S. <coughs> Uh, whims and policy making and sanctions and, and financial reach. Um, uh, whether this particular SPV will be useful, well, I think we need to wait and see whether it'll be useful for Iran to begin with, because so far it's not that promising. Um, but uh, certainly it is, I believe, the beginning of a process that's going to put in place you know, alternative mechanisms, alternative systems that's eventually going to erode U.S. reach. Can I pop in for a second Please. and then we'll end, end with your, sure. your wrap-up? Uh, the, the question about um, Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, I think what, what, what that raises is the, the bigger strategic problem in managing the region is that the region is in, uh, is in sort of maximalist, maximalist uh, 
uh, uh, conflict. I mean, uh, so on every possible level, not just military, but military as well, with war, hot wars going on. Um, and every player that has regional reach is doing the most destabilizing possible thing. So mm -hmm. Israel is unsettling its neighbors. Uh, Iran is, is uh, pursuing a really destabilizing maximalist uh, uh, foreign policy in the Arab region anyway, in Yemen, in Syria, in, in, in Lebanon. And Saudi Arabia now has joined the sort of rogue rogues gallery of, of regional powers that are also doing the most possible destabilizing uh, set of actions. And so from certainly like a, a U.S. vantage point um, or, a, or just a, a sort of international system vantage point, what we want is th these countries to integrate better with each other and engage in less conflict. More, uh, you know, uh, let it be safer for them to explore and pump their oil. Let it be, you know, less expensive for them to, 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 to function and, uh, and for it to be less expensive for all of us uh, to be fighting wars and doing counterterrorism operations in this ever-expanding theater. Um, and uh, Iran is, is a major culprit in this. So is the United States. So is Israel. So is Saudi Arabia. And Turkey as well. I mean, those are the main culprits. You can also throw in Qatar and others in there as, uh, as, as problem, problem states. But we are causing a lot of these problems uh, collectively. Um, and uh, until that process reverses, um, it's going to be very expensive uh, for people living in the region in terms of life loss and stability and very expensive from a strategic vantage point because we can't, you know, we can't manage this region if it's any kind of ferment. Um, and that's the, that's the kind of thing that American leadership can affect when there is American leadership. So, you know, uh, uh, an America acting in good faith can't make Israel or Saudi Arabia do what it wants, but it has persuasive tools at its disposal. It can dial down tensions. It can ask uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and so on to act in harmony on certain issues. Um, and, and that has real benefits in terms of life saved, dollars earned, uh, wealth created. Um, and, uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think can uh, be resumed at some point when uh, the United States chooses to, to sort of re-engage. Re well, but meanwhile, um, two countries have been uh, incredibly good um, at uh, balancing these different um, sets of interests on these different capitals, right? And that's Russia and China. Both Russia and China um, have forged relationships with Israel, with Saudi Arabia, yeah. with Iran. They're the two only countries that can now um, you know, and in fact, Putin did that. He received the Iranian uh, advisor to the supreme leader, and a few days later or before, he, he received Prime Minister Netanyahu. So, uh, you know, they, they are very good at balancing these different sets of interests, and it goes back to our argument, which is that they, they don't forge strategic alliances. Um, they balance different countries, and they just pursue their own interests and, and form these ad hoc sort of relationships. Um, I also want to caution against sort of putting, you know, n overlooking uh, Israeli domestic um, politics and, and the dynamics there. Um, yes, you do have a faction um, that is very much against the, the JCPOA, but you also have people who, uh, within the security establishment who have been strong supporters of the JCPOA. Um, and the Syria conflict has made Israel become a lot more cautious in terms of uh, and understand really the, the, the possibility of escalation with Iran in, in Syria. So we need to be careful not to kind of, we tend to like buckets, right? I mean, that's exactly what we do. We put uh, Russia and China in a bucket in, in some way in, in, this, uh, in the book. But we have to be careful not to kind of put Israel and Saudi Arabia in that sense in the same bucket. Um, the fat of question, um, you're exactly right that, that was, that's been one of the most divisive discussions within Iran. Uh, for a little bit of uh, background, this uh, is a bill that has been discussed in the, par in the Iranian parliament uh, for a while now uh, that would allow Iran to sort of normalize its uh, very problematic economic sector um, by, um, by stopping money laundering and terrorism financing, two critical issues for their national community. So to address your question whether or not this would, um, if the bill ends up uh, becoming enacted, whether it would facilitate um, transactions and, and trade between Iran and Russia and China, um, it would be helpful, but it's not going to make it or break it. Um, 
But I think the more sort of uh, the, the short term question is whether or not it even becomes enacted into law. Um, there was a period a few weeks ago where it seemed like it was a done deal and it was moving forward. Um, and now it seems like they're taking a few steps back again, um, even though this seems to be a big priority for the government. Um, I think Foreign Minister Zarif just yesterday um, or today um, uh, was uh, got under a lot of fire again for, for um, uh, uh, pointing uh, at money laundering as one of the critical issues that Iran is, is facing. Uh, but in the long term, if Iran wants to normalize its economy, if it wants to attract businesses that are largely risk averse, that this is going to be a critical step. Um, uh, the problem, of course, is that, again, domestic politics get in the way. Um, and so it's, um, uh, you know, we, it's, a, it's a big question mark as um, where we sit today. Finally, your question about whether or not the U.S. can change Iran, Iranian behavior. Um, being a Washingtonian, I'm not surprised that this is a conversation we keep having. Uh, but I think there are a couple of challenges with um, the administration's approach. The first one is that the administration has laid out a broad set of objectives. Uh, 12 points initially, now seems to be 13 points uh, laid out by Secretary Pompeo, which spans everything from Iran's human rights uh, abuses to its regional policies to its nuclear and missile programs. Um, and ultimately, what that reads, if you're sitting, what that reads like if you're sitting in Tehran is essentially capitulation. It's not a change in behavior, it's a change in regime, right? It's a change in everything, fu in the fundamental ways in which you conduct business. Um, and while I share the sentiment um, uh, th that uh, Secretary Pompeo has, has laid out, uh, I think that it is unrealistic to expect the maximum pressure campaign to yield these results. The second issue is that the administration has stepped away from using its policy toolkit to using sanctions and sanctions only mm -hmm. to maximize pressure to the point of getting Iran to capitulate and to do so in a way that yields the perfect result for the United States, the perfect deal, whatever that may look like, and that it, that, and that it does so in a, in a sustainable way. And you can't have all of those things at the same time. You can't ask for a country to capitulate first then to give you everything you want, and then to do that in a, in a long-term way, right? To do that in a sustainable way. Um, and so I, I think that if the metric here is whether or not Iran changes its behavior to comply with the Secretary's demands, then I don't think that is realistic. I don't think that's going to, to happen. Um, I also think that you need to be a bit more um, sort of limited excuse me, limited in your objectives, and you need to be able to use your, your tool, your, all of your tools, not just one tool, um, to, to achieve that. Would uh, Iran survive the assassination of Qasem Soleimani? <laughs> right, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, it would. Um, <laughs> What's your question not to be No, that's, I mean, so I think we have this sort of, out, this outsized, um, view of Soleimani as the critical player next to the supreme leader in Iran. Yes, he's a very important player. He um, has been instrumental um, in designing Iran's regional policies. At the same time, though, uh, Iranian decision making, again, is, is um, the product of a number of power centers. Uh, and Soleimani is an important part of that, but he is a part of that. He is not the entire system. So believing that the, the, the any one revolutionary guard or any one official um, being assassinated or, or whatever you may have uh, would change Iran's, you know, the, the regime, would lead to the collapse of the regime, I think is, uh, is not quite realistic. For fantasy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you can go online and order triple axis, <laughs> Iran's relations with Russia and China. It's an excellent read um, and you'll be supporting an excellent publishing house, Ivy Taurus, and two fine researchers if you do it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks.